Okay, students. All right, so let's move on now to the next section uh, on starting probability theory. So uh, in order for us to, uh, we would like to be able to assign numbers to events from uh, sample spaces to describe how likely those events are. And in order to do so, we need to develop a notion of probability. So we'll start by defining what a probability measure is. So we have, so we have what's known as a probability measure, P, and this is a function. It's a function that takes events as inputs and returns numbers between zero and one and satisfies the following three axioms. And axioms are things that are true basically because we say so. They're, they're uh, almost similar to assumptions. Um, um, maybe you remember uh, axioms from geometry, but the idea is that we have some starting things that we simply say they are true because they are almost self-evident. First, we say that every probability must be at least zero. Uh, you cannot have negative probabilities. Second, we say that the probability of the sample space is equal to one. So the probability that anything happens is equal to one. Finally, uh, this is the weirdest looking axiom. If we have a sequence of disjoint events, uh, so in other words, for any uh, i that's i equal to j, the intersection of uh, any two such events is uh, equal to the empty set. And furthermore, this is for a potentially infinite sequence of disjoint events. We say that the probability of the union of those events is equal to the sum of their individual probabilities. This is very wordy. This is very technical. There is a much easier way to understand what this axiom is saying if we decide, well, okay, there's usually only one situation where you're going to understand uh, where you're actually going to use this axiom most of the time, which is that if A intersected with B is equal to the empty set, so if A and B are two disjoint events, then the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. So the probability of uh, two events that have nothing in common, uh, if the probability that either one happens will be the sum of their individual probabilities. Okay, so these are true because we say so. And from this, we get uh, pretty much everything else that we believe should be true about uh, probability uh, or about how probabilities work. So uh, for starters, uh, we have uh, that the probability of the empty set is equal to zero. So this is not something that we said. This is not something that we said must be true. This is simply something that, um, this is actually a consequence of the assumptions that we have made up to this point. So this is kind of a weird, so we're going to show that this is in fact true using just these uh, three, um, just these three assumptions, uh, just these three axioms. Uh, so only uh, these three things. All right. Um, now that said, we're going to have to use the fact that the probability of the sample space is equal to one. What we could say is this, the sample space, the sample space is equal to uh, the sample space uh, unioned with the empty set. And in order to use axiom three in the way we have written axiom three down, we're going to have to say that the empty set is equal to uh, the union from I equals one uh, to, well, I equals one to infinity, the empty set. So in other words, we need to create an infinite union of empty sets. And it's certainly true that if you take an infinite a collection of empty sets and you union them all together, there's still not going to be anything in that union, so you're still going to have the empty set. Furthermore, the intersection of the empty set with the empty set is also going to be the empty set, so technically the empty set is disjoint with itself. So that means that this collection of empty sets, this giant uh, repeating of the empty set, technically satisfies the condition of uh, the conditions of the third axiom. So then, and, and, and also it's true that the, set, the sample space uh, intersected with the empty set is going to be the empty set because the empty set is a subset of the sample space. 
Therefore, we can now apply this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, third axiom to prove the prop uh, proposition because we know that one is equal to the probability of the sample space and the probability of the sample space is equal to the probability of the sample spaced uh, unioned with the empty set which is equal to uh, the probability of the sample space unioned with this infinite collection of uh, empties of uh, empty sets and then we apply that third axiom to say that uh, uh, this is going to equal to the probability of the sample space uh, plus uh, the uh, plus um, the uh, the sum from uh, uh, i equals one to infinity uh, the probability of the empty set and what that forces us to then say is that since uh, the probability of the sample space is equal to one, we're forced then to say that the sum from i equals one to infinity of the probability of the empty set is equal to zero. But that's only going to be possible if the probability of the empty set is itself equal to zero. Um, because since probabilities uh, cannot um, be uh, uh, negative and oh and even just because of the fact that uh, we're adding up something an infinite number of times and that's and that's the exact same thing and it adds up to zero so that means that each one of those must be equal to zero therefore this uh, axiom uh, this uh, proposition is proven this one this is actually rather weird it's it's so surprising like there, there is a way in which you, you, you kind of just want to say uh, you have one equals to the probability of the sample space, which is equal to uh, the probability of the sample space plus uh, the sample space unioned with the empty set. And then it turns into a sum of probabilities. And uh, that means that the probability of the empty set is equal to zero. But we have to, in order to be mathematically rigorous, use these axioms in the way they were written down. So we would actually have written the axiom in a way in which it wasn't written and therefore wouldn't be able to uh, directly apply it. So we had to be really tricky, but the good news is that we only had to be tricky really once with this uh, proposition, just with this one. Because now that we have this proposition, the others will not, nearly, uh, will not be nearly as uh, strange. For example, proposition three. Like this, this proposition, if we had this already, then that proposition that we just proved would actually be rather easy because uh, the complement of the sample space is equal to the empty set. Uh, the probability of the, sa the sample space uh, is equal to one. And since the, uh, uh, the, the empty set is the complement of the sample space, we can say if this proposition three were in fact true, uh, the probability of the empty set uh, is equal to one minus the probability of the sample space, which is uh, one minus one, which equals zero, right? If we had proposition three, then it would actually be rather easy to prove that the probability of the empty set is zero. But the thing though is in order to be able to prove uh, proposition three, we're going to have to uh, probably use uh, some of those uh, other propositions. So unfortunately uh, it's, it's um, it's not quite that it's we we technically need to take a very long circuitous route uh in our proof before we can actually uh invoke this one so what we're going to say is that the probability of the sample space we can say that the sample space can be divided into uh into the set a unioned with the complement of a and uh, a union a complement. Um, well, okay, inter a intersected with a complement um, is equal to the empty set. So since a intersected with uh, its complement is is the empty set, that means that these two sets are going to be disjoint, which means that we can then invoke uh, that um, uh, that a uh, second that third axiom and say that the probability of the sample space is equal to the probability 
of a union a complement, uh, which is equal to by that act that other axiom the probability of a plus the probability of a complement, and uh, by the first axiom this is all equal to one. Therefore, if you do a little bit of algebra where you subtract uh, you uh, subtract both from both sides the probability of a. Uh, after you do that algebra, you can now say that the probability of a complement is equal to 1 minus the probability of a. And we're done. That uh, proposition has been proven. Uh, next proposition. We have that the probability of a is less than or equal to 1 for any event a. Uh, let me get caught up in my uh, notes over here. All right, uh, so uh, the probability of a complement, uh, since a complement is in fact an event, uh, by the first axiom, uh, we get to say that the probability of a complement is greater than or equal to zero, which means that one minus the probability of a is gonna be greater than or equal to zero, and therefore it follows after, oops, uh, after we add the probability of a to both sides, after we do that, uh, we get to say that, uh, uh, so since these two things end up canceling out, uh, the probability of a is less than or equal to one. So that proposition has been proven. Uh, next one. Where is that it? No, that's not it. Uh, the probability of A union B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersected with B for any events A and B. So uh, this, by the way, is generalizing more or less that third axiom, since that third axiom required disjoint events, whereas here in this proposition, we do not require disjoint events. Um, we do not require just disjoint events, and the penalty that we pay for that is that we have to subtract out the probability of the intersection. Here's the thing, though. Uh, this this makes perfect sense, what, what's going on if we draw a Venn diagram. Um, it turns out that probability uh, is part of this general class of mathematical objects, uh, or probability measures are part of this general class of mathematical objects known as measures. And amongst that family of, of mathematical objects, we include things such as measures of area or measures of length, which means that it's actually rather appropriate uh, and convenient to reason about probabilities the same way we reason about uh, areas or lengths as we do in the real world. So let's think instead about we have um, a couple uh, sets, A and B, we want to figure out what the area is in A and B, like the that's enclosed within both of those. We want to figure out that area. Um, and how we're going to do so is uh, we have a couple sheets. We have an A sheet and a B sheet, and we lay them down, and we have some scissors. So uh, we can measure the areas of these sheets. So uh, given that, um, we're able to measure the areas of these sheets, how could we possibly compute the area that's enclosed in both A and B? Well, what we would do is we would lay down the A sheet onto uh, this diagram and we would have its area. Then we would lay down the B sheet on this diagram and we would have its area. But the thing though is, once we've done that, we now have an overlap. We have an overlapping area um, so we've actually overcounted the area um, in A and B. We, the number is too large. So what we need to do is subtract out uh, the part, the overlapping part of uh, A and B, subtract out its area, because otherwise we would have double counted it. So we're going to uh, subtract out that area, um, and uh, or at least we'll like cut out a little slice of it. Um, uh, maybe just like the red slice part and leaving only the blue part left. And and we're allowed to measure the area of the part that we cut out. 
So uh, after we uh, subtract the, the area that we removed, we now have the area that's enclosed between, uh, th that's closed within these two circles. And that's an aerial way to understand why this formula here is in fact true. Because this is based, because how I described it is basically what we're doing. We have the area of the region A and the area of the region e B, and we subtract out once the area that's in between them since we accidentally, well, not accidentally, since uh, without doing so, uh, we would have double counted that part. So we need to remove the double counting. So how are, now that's like a, a reasoning for what we're doing. And now let's turn that into um, a series of mathematical statements and a proof. Uh, here's a way to think about this uh, region, this Venn diagram. We can divide up uh, in this Venn diagram. Uh, we can divide up uh, it, this uh, region so that we have uh, the light blue region, we have the green region, and we have the red region. We will call the uh, blue region A and not B. We will call the green region A and B. And we will call the red region uh, not A and B. And it's clear that these three regions are... Um, uh, the, uh, these three regions are disjoint. You can see so visually, but if you wanted a non-visual way to reason why that is the case, let's suppose an element is, let's, let's suppose that we pick a point in that is in the set A and not B. Can that set be in A and B? Well, it must not, because in order to be in the part A and B, it must be, be in B, uh, but it is not in B since it's in A and not B, so it cannot be in there. And uh, similarly for... Uh, not A and B, and for the same reason, if you're in A and not B, you cannot also be in not A and B, since you are in A, and therefore you're not in not A. I know this is the verbiage is getting really complicated, but that is this, that is really the logic for why these things must be disjoint. Or you can just look at the picture and be satisfied. Um, for that reason, we can say that the. I mean, you can also look at this picture and see that when you take the union of these three. Uh, events, uh, you have in fact the region A or B. And there's also no double counting here, since you counted each little part, uh, this each division once. So now we can say, uh, I'm going to zoom in uh, some more. We're, we can say that the probability of A or B is equal to, uh, invoking that third axiom, the probability of A and not B plus the probability of A and B, plus uh, the probability of um, uh, not A and B. And uh, let's see, let's see, what sh how should I proceed next? Well, I do notice, for starters, that this part right here is equal to the probability of A, um, which is uh, clear from the picture. Because if you add the probability of A and not B and the probability of A and B, then you're basically kind of the probability of A. So this must be the probability of A. Uh, but the thing is, though, um, we need to somehow account for... Uh, I mean, we end up in the end with a subtraction of the probability of A and B. So how are we going to do that, huh? Well, if we look at the probability of B, we could say, as an aside, that the probability of B is equal to the probability, for basically uh, the reasons that I just wrote here, that this is the probability of um, uh, A and B uh, plus the probability of uh, uh, not A and B. And then if you do some algebra, you can then say that the probability of not A and B is equal to the probability of B minus uh, the probability 
of uh, A and B. Okay. Oh, well, look at that. We now basically have what we need because we've identified a part as the probability of A, and we can also identify the latter part in this sum as the probability of B uh, minus the probability of uh, A and B, which is exactly the statement that we wanted to prove. So therefore, we're done. And we have, in fact, proven this statement. And notice that this statement does in fact include that third axiom since if since that third axiom was about disjoint events. So um, uh, if we have a disjoint event, we've proven in uh, in uh, our the first proposition that we proved in this section that the probability of the empty set is equal to zero, and the subtraction of the probability of A and B is going to give you. Um, so, so that's going to, uh, so the intersection of A and B, if, in, since in this imaginary scenario they're uh, uh, disjoint, that's going to be the probability of the empty set, which is equal to zero. And thus you get uh, that, uh, that other axiom. All right, so, uh, oh, oops, I am, uh, I am doing something that I don't want to do. Uh, what I want to do is zoom out. Okay, um, so the next proposition I'm not going to bother to prove just because it's a lot of work. Uh, although I may give you an argument for why it's true. So proposition six, now we have three events, A, B, and C. And the probability of the union of those three events is going to be the sum of the probabilities of the events minus the probabilities of intersections of two plus the probability of the intersection of all three. All right, so I'm not going to prove this, but I'm going to give you an argument for why this must be true. So here we have our sample space. Um, we have the set A, we have the set B, and we have the set C. It's basically the same reasoning as we used before. Um, let's uh, uh, let's see. So uh, so what does it mean to add the probability of A, probably B, probably C? So if we add those three probabilities, so we're going to add the probability of A, because what we're trying to do is figure out in the area that is enclosed in all three circles. Uh, but those circles are overlapping with each other, so we need to figure out how to handle the overlaps. So we're going to color in the probability of A. That's what we're told to do first. Uh, then we're going to color in the region enclosed by B. Uh, that's what we need to do second. And then we're going to enclose the region enclosed uh, then we're going to color in the region enclosed by C. Because that's what we've been told to do. Um, yeah, you can almost read this as a set of instructions on how to calculate an, uh, uh, how to calculate um, uh, um, uh, an area. So we see that we have done some double counting. We've double counted here, we've double counted here, and we've double counted here. All right, so uh, we need to remove those double counts. Uh, let's start with the um, let, let's uh, let's start with the double counting here. We're going to uh, subtract out uh, the probability of A and B, which will I will under, I will understand that as subtracting out a little green sliver. Uh, so how does this? I'm wondering if this is doing some. Oh no, it just was being laggy. All right, so um, so I have subtracted out the green area from that sliver, uh, leaving uh, blue left and some red red left. Okay, uh, and then I need to I, I'm going to cut out the uh, red area that is intersecting a that is at the intersection of A and C. Okay, so I'm going to cut that out, uh, leaving only blue, uh, um, leaving only blue there. Uh, let's see. So we're going to have uh, right here. So and then we need to uh, cut out the area that is in the intersection of B uh, and so. We now need to cut out the uh, region that's in uh, both B and C. So we're going to subtract out uh, the red area. But the thing is, that doesn't that doesn't uh, that isn't enough. 
we cannot just take out the red area because we need to take out uh, everything that's in here. So we also have to take out what that little blue sliver that's left as well. So uh, we're going to be left with green in that in that spot. Uh, but the thing is, in that little sliver uh, that that is in the intersection of all three, we have now cut out. Oops, uh, we have now cut out too much, and that area is not being accounted for at all. There's nothing left in there. So we need to add that area back in in order to be able to have an accurate computation of the area. And there we go. So after we add it back in, uh, we now have the area. So everything has been colored uh, exactly once. And uh, we're able to compute the area, of, uh, how much area we've colored. Uh, in a sense, so we have what we need. So not exactly a proof because we need to uh, do some do some of that uh, tricky algebra business, but uh, we're not going to bother with that. This should give you an idea of why it's true. Okay, uh, so the next example that all of that stuff was uh, uh, rather theoretical. Uh, let's let's um, start seeing how uh, probability theory is actually going to be used. So for the most part of the remainder of the section. I'm going to be going through a number of illustrative examples. Uh, we do talk a little bit more about uh, theory, mostly about what probability means. Uh, but uh, for the most part, we can just talk about um, examples. So example nine, reconsider the experiment of flipping a coin and assume that the coin is equally likely to land with each face facing up. Assign probabilities to all outcomes in the sample space. So recall that the sample space for this experiment consists of the outcome heads and the outcome tails. And we're assuming that all of the outcomes in this sample space are equally likely. So that means that the probability of uh, getting heads, uh, and I'm writing this in terms of a simple event, but honestly, this writing it this way often gets rather tedious. So I'm often going to admit uh, to omit the curly braces that are usually used to denote sets and just write whatever is in the set. So we have the probability of H. Uh, this is going to equal the probability of T because all outcomes are equally likely. So the thing though is the probability of the sample space is equal to uh, the probability of the set containing only H unioned with the set containing only T since this uh, so since the union of those two sets is in fact equal to the sample space and furthermore those two sets have nothing in common one has H one has T and they don't share anything so that means that they are disjoint events and therefore we can write this probability as a sum as the probability of H uh, plus the probability of T and both of these are the same so we're going to say that this is equal to P uh, so this is equal to uh, P plus P which is 2p. And furthermore, we know from uh, axiom 2 that the probability of the sample space is equal to 1. So this is equal to 1. And that implies, after you do some division by 2, that p is equal to 1 half. Which makes perfect sense, right? If you're saying that heads is just as likely as tails, then the probability of getting heads is 1, one half. Perfectly intuitive, right? Well, you know, uh, probability is intuitive up until the point it isn't. And when it stops being intuitive, it really stops being intuitive. And it becomes suddenly very, very strange. So it's simultaneously intuitive and unintuitive. In fact, I've heard someone say that there are fewer subjects with as many paradoxes. They're not literally paradoxes, but they contradict how humans think of the world. Very few subjects have as many paradoxes as probability. Because probability can get really weird really fast. We have not reached that point yet, but we probably will eventually. Uh, example 10. Uh, do the same as example 9, but when rolling a single dice. That is, um, we are trying to... Uh, so we, we're, we're trying to, to assign probabilities to outcomes in a sample space when we say that those outcomes are equally likely. So the sample space in this case is going to consist of die rolls. Um, so we have uh, an outcome one, uh, two, uh, three, uh, four, five, 
and six. Okay, so those are our six outcomes, and we say that each one of them is equally likely. So that means that the probability of rolling a one is the same as is uh, the same as the probability of rolling a two, and that's going to be the same as dot 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 as this and the same as uh, the probability of rolling a six. All right, so uh, it's a six. So, all right, there we go, six. It's an it's an oddly painted die. All right, so all of those are going to be the same, and we're just going to say for convenience that this is equal to p. All right, so then uh, we say that the probability of the sample space is equal to the probability of the result one uh, unioned with the result uh, two unioned with dot 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 unioned with uh, the uh, outcome uh, containing uh, six. There we go. Because that's equal to the sample space. You basically written the sample space as a union of each of its elements. And furthermore, each of these sets again are disjoint. So uh, we can then write them as the sum of probabilities. So say that this is equal to the probability of rolling a one uh, plus the probability of rolling a two plus dot, 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 plus the probability of rolling a six. And then we use the fact that we said from the beginning that all of these probabilities are the same. So this is p plus p plus p plus p plus p plus p. So this is equal to 6p. But it's also equal to 1 because of axiom 2. That says that the probability of the sample space is equal to 1. Therefore, p must be equal to 1 over 6. And you can see where this is going. In general, if you have a sample space with a finite number of elements, uh, and you say each of those elements are equally likely, then the probability of a single one of those elements in that sample space, the probability of drawing that element is going to be one divided by the size of the sample space or the number of elements, number of unique elements in that sample space. Um, so in fact, what we're seeing here can be very easily generalized. Okay. Uh, so example 11, we're now going to try and move away from equally likely outcomes and say, that the dice from example 10 has been altered with weights, now the probability of the dice rolling a 6 is twice as likely as rolling a 1, while all the other sides have the same probability of appearing as before. Therefore, we want to know what the new probability model is. So we're going to say that the probability of uh, rolling a 6, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so the probability of this of rolling a six is equal to two times the probability of rolling a one. And we're just going to say that's equal to two times P or, uh, uh, we'll just, we'll, we'll try to keep things a little bit different. We'll call it Q this time. All right. So we need to figure out Q because Q gives us the probability of rolling a one. And if we figure out the probability of rolling a one, we then instantly know rolling a six. Now, remember, these are the only two faces that have been altered. All the other dice faces have the exact same probability as before. So the probability of rolling a 2 is equal to the probability of rolling a 3, which is the probability of rolling a 4, which is the probability of rolling a 5, and all, all of those are equal to 1 over 6. So that means um, that the probability of rolling a 1 uh, plus the probability of rolling a 2 uh, plus dot 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 plus the probability of rolling a 5 uh, plus the probability of rolling a 6 Ugh. come on cooperate you stupid screen I hate drawing the 6 because my screen is not very cooperative all right 
this is equal to one. But uh, what's different now is that all of these are equal to one over six. So you end up adding one over six four times since it's two, three, four, five. There's four things there. Um, the probability of rolling a six is equal to two Q and the probability of rolling a one is equal to Q. Okay, so um, collecting all of that information, uh, we now say um, that we have a, a Q plus two Q plus uh, four over six, which is two over three is equal to one, uh, which implies after you do some algebra that three Q is equal to one third, which then means that Q is equal to nine. Uh, no, is equal to one over nine, not nine, because that's not even a probability. Uh, that's 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 one thing to keep in mind. If you get a probability that's above one, you have made a mistake. So nine is not possible. The prob so that means that the probability of rolling a one. So yeah, let's let's uh, write this down now. The probability of rolling a one in this new probability model is equal to one ninth. And the probability of rolling a six in this new probability model is equal to two over nine. And in fact, this is in, this is consistent because one over nine plus two over nine is equal to three over nine, which is one third. There are the uh, other dice faces, when you add up their probabilities, you add one over six, one over six, one over six, one over six, which is two thirds. And so you have one third plus two thirds, which equals one. So the probabilities still add up to one, which means that we're fine. This is a way for you to check. Uh, whether, th this is one way for you to check that you're that when you do your probability calculations, you have done so correctly. Make sure that all the probabilities add up to one. If they don't add up to one, you've made a mistake. I remember once a student was uh, working in a. Uh, I had a student of mine, and I gave her a quiz, and she had to do some calculations with probabilities. And uh, she added up the probability sample space and it added up to something that was to some fraction. It might have been uh, maybe uh, eight over nine or eight, like 80 over 81. Who knows? But but I said, this is very wrong. And she's like, well, it, it needs to add up to one. And she said, well, it's close to one. And I said, close to one is not one. So if it doesn't add up to one, it's just wrong. It, like close to one, no caboose. It's either one or it's not one. And if it doesn't add up to one, it's wrong. It's very wrong. It always adds up to one. So that's a way for you to check that you've done things correctly. Make sure that your probabilities add up to one. Okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, example 12. Uh, reconsider the experiment of rolling two six-sided die. It is reasonable to assume that each outcome in S is equally likely. This is the reason why instead of writing uh, the numbers 2 through 12, or maybe just uh, listing out um, without really caring about the ordering of the die, or not really thinking about there being a red die and a blue die, uh, we, we decided that we were actually going to assign an ordering to the dice. It's so that we could basically work with problem example 12 and get a reasonable looking probability model. Because now, if we assume that the two dice are distinct, we can now say that everything in the sample space in that uh, sample space with a red and blue die is equally likely and then get accurate probability calculations. So uh, getting back to this, uh, it is reasonable to assume that each outcome in the sample space S is equally likely. What then is the probability of each outcome in S? Um, well, basically I already argued it uh, to you before. We'll say that omega is an element of S. So this, I'm saying this in general, right? Um, omega is the element is an element in, in S and every element in S is equally likely. I argued before without writing it down that the probability of drawing Omega then will be one divided by the size of S. So in this case, for example, 12, uh, where you have two six sided dice, um, the size of the sample space was 36. So the probability of a, sing of, a, of a particular outcome of dice is going to be 1 over 36. Now we can use this, uh, this model uh, to find the probability of an event E. where uh, So I'll, I'll just go ahead and write down in this case that um, the size of the sample space S is equal to 36. 
So for this particular problem, this is going to be 1 over 36. But in fact, what I just wrote down here true, it, what I just wrote down here is pretty much true in general. Like, um, I'm, I'm thinking in the context of uh, rolling a couple die, but actually this is true in general. When you say that S, which is a finite sample space, it has a finite number of elements, um, when everything in that sample space is equally likely, um, then the probability of an individual individual element is going to be one over the samples over the size of the sample space and it's not too hard why go ahead uh, show that uh, the uh, probability of the sample space when you do this is equal to one uh, so use this model to find the probability of an event e where first e is the event where at least one die is a six so let's actually write down um let's write down uh what's in e so that would be we have a red die and a blue die. At least one die is six. So that includes when the red die is one and the blue die uh, is six. Uh, we have uh, the case when the red die is two and the blue die is six. Uh, we have, and we can keep going on like this until we eventually reach the case where uh, the the red die is a five, the red die is five, and the blue die is six. Ugh. Damn it, you cooperate. All right, that's six. <laughs> um, so uh, that's one set of outcomes. And notice that there's, uh, that I've just uh, listed down five elements. Okay. Uh, so next up, we will now make the red die six. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. It never wants to do the last one. Never ever wants to do the last one. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six, and the blue die is one. And uh, just just repeat, just keep uh, carrying on with this logic until we get where the red dice is six and the blue dice is five. And finally, we have one last outcome where both the red die and the blue die are six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. All right. So uh, there are... Um, five elements where the uh, um, where, where the red die is fixed at six and then there's one extra element where uh, both of them are, are six so that means that the size of this event is going to be um, 11 which then means when we're computing the probability of this event we could add up the probability of each one of these outcomes and each one of these outcomes has an equal likelihood. And, and they all have an equal probability. All of those probabilities are 36. So you're going to add up 36, no, 1 over 36, 11 times. So this is going to add up to 11 over 36. And in fact, it's, once you have this, uh, this um, assumption that all outcomes in this finite sample space are equally likely, in general... The probability of any event E is going to be the number of elements in E or the size of E divided by the size of the sample space. So at this point, all we need to do is decide how, determine how many elements are in our event in order to figure out that event's probability. All right. So for let's let's use that now for uh, this uh, next problem where E is the set where, uh, is the event where the sum of the pips showing on the two die is uh, five. 
how many outcomes are there where the sum is going to be five? Uh, let's start listing out uh, possible uh, things in this sample space. So uh, we've got, I, I guess I've been writing the red dice first. Okay, so. Okay, so this is, all right, so I've been writing out the red die first. So let's suppose, let's see, the, the two dice is five. So can the red dice be one? Yeah, sure, why not? Uh, the red dice can be one, and if it's one, well, it must add up to five, so that means that the blue dice must be four. Okay, that's one possibility. Uh, next possibility is when the blue dice is two, in which uh, is when the red dice is two, sorry, in which case the blue dice must be three. Uh, we could have the case where the red dice is three, in which case the blue dice must be two. And finally, we have the case where uh, the red dice is four, in which case the blue dice must be one. And we can't go to five because uh, it's not possible for the blue, blue dice to roll a zero. Um, so we're just gonna have to end it there. Uh, we now have of a sample, uh, an event, and this event has four outcomes in it. So that means that the size of the event is going to be uh, four, in which case the probability of the event E is going to be uh, four over 36, which is going to be uh, one over nine. Okay, next part, uh, E is the event where the maximum of the two numbers showing on the dice is greater than two. Okay, now the, here's the thing though. Um, there's actually a lot of outcomes in this event. So we could attempt to try and figure out how many outcomes there are where the larger of the two numbers is greater than two. Well, let's see, we could even have like three, one, three, two, three, 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 four, three, or five, three, six, all the, all the cases where the red dice is three and that's already six such outcomes. And that's only for three. So uh, this could actually be quite difficult to compute, uh, except for the fact that it's actually much easier to compute the, comp the probability of the complement of this event. If we were to look at the complement of the event E, that's going to be the event where the maximum um, of the two dice is um, not greater than two. It, so it's at most two. Okay, uh, where, what, are, what are combinations of dice face, faces where the maximum is at most two? Well, we have one situation where uh, we have, um, oh yeah, I said that the red dice is first. So we have the situation where the red dice is one and the blue dice is one. All right, in that case, the maximum of the two dice is going to be one and that is uh, not greater than two. So this is in fact in our event. Uh, then we have the outcome where the red dice is two and the blue dice is one. In that case, the maximum would be two and that doesn't exceed two. So uh, this is in our event. Uh, we also have uh, the case where the red dice is one and the blue dice is two. Let's see, all right, there we go. So the blue dice is a uh, two. And we also have the outcome where the red dice is two and the blue dice is two. I mean, the maximum of those in, in this case would be two. And again, that's uh, at most two. And we had to stop there because the, because the, the the next thing we would do is make one of the dice th at least three, and in which case the maximum would be at least three. So it's not no longer going to be in this event. So therefore, we have an event with four outcomes in it, and the probability of the complement of the event E is going to be the number of things in the complement of E, uh, which is four divided by thirty six, which is equal to one over nine. All right, we're cooking because now we can use one of those propositions that said that the probability of the complement of an event is one minus the probability of the event. So that means that the probability 
of E itself, which is what we actually want to compute a probability of, that's going to be 1 minus the probability of E complement, because E is the complement of E complement. Uh, so, and that's going to be 1 minus 1 over 9, which is 8 over 9. There we go. We've, we've solved it. And that's much easier than if we tried to do it directly. And this is one reason why you care about uh, these uh, complementation rules, because sometimes it's easier work to work with the complement of an event rather than the event itself. If we had tried to work with that event, uh, we would have ended up with a sample space with... Uh, or, or an event with um, uh, 32 elements, or or a size of 32. So we would have ended up having to count 32 things. I mean, it's not like impossible to count 32 things, but it's also a lot more work. So, so this is a very good trick to have, and something that you should be looking out for when you're doing your own work. You should be looking out for situations where the complement is actually easier to work with than the actual event itself. Okay. Uh, just real quick, uh, satisfy my nervousness. All right, we're still streaming. All right, so we shall continue. Example 13. Reconsider the experiment of flipping a coin until heads is seen. Ooh, this one. This one's going to get uh, rather involved. What is one way to assign probabilities to all outcomes of this experiment so that we have a legal probability model? Justify your answer. So, how could we possibly do this? Because we no longer can say that uh, each outcome in the sample space is equally likely, because that only works when the sample space is finite. But as I mentioned before, this sample space is infinite. Um, there's an infinite number of outcomes in the sample space, since it's basically the integers in a way. It's, you can map the sample space to the integers, and kind of identify it with the integers, or not the integers, but the natural numbers. And in fact, I think that's what we should do. We should uh, try to view this sample space in terms of the natural numbers. Uh, I'm going to want to zoom in for this one. Zooming in for me is a way to get to almost get more room on uh, this uh, piece of paper. So we're going to say um, we're, we're going to define n of omega. So omega is an element of this sample space. So this is going to be one of those strings, heads, tails, heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, 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 heads, and so on. So we'll say that um, n of omega is going to equal the length of the string uh, omega. So for example, uh, n of the string tth, this is a string of length three. It then follows that, um, using, uh, abusing notation a little bit because n is a function that doesn't take sets as inputs but let's suppose for a second that we were to put a set as the input. This is actually pretty commonly done. Uh, often when you have a function and you plug in uh, its domain, what you're talking, what you're actually referring to is a set representing the range of that function. So in this case, uh, the range of the function n is going to be the natural numbers. It's going to be one, two, three, four, and so on. These are all the possible outcomes. It's going to be the natural numbers. Okay. So um, I'm going to suggest that what we should do for our probability assignment is say that the probability of an outcome omega is equal to uh, one half to the power of uh, n of omega. So in other words, it's going to be one half to the power of the length of the string omega. So for example, in the in this uh, earlier case where we had TTH, uh, the probability of that outcome TTH would be uh, one half to the power of the length of the string TTH, or one half to the power of three, which is one over eight. Okay. All right then. So this is a suggestion for what the probability should be. 
but now we need to make sure that this is a valid probability measure. So what is what needs to be true in order for this to be the case? First off is the probability of, um, are all probabilities greater than or equal to zero under this method? Yes, that is certainly true because there's no way that this function will produce negative numbers. Uh, secondly, uh, is the probability of the sample space equal to one? Uh, well, that's actually something that we're probably going to have to check. And then there's that third axiom about um, the probability of a, excuse me, uh, about the probability of unions of uh, disjoint events. And I'm not going to check that one because that one's actually getting rather complicated. Uh, that's getting even more theoretical, a bit too theoretical for this class. But I personally think it's perfectly appropriate to check that under this probability model, the probability of the sample space is equal to one. Um, and in fact, in my classes, uh, this is actually something that I love to ask questions about on quizzes. I love to ask students that uh, the probability of the sample space is equal to one under some probability model. I love asking that. Um, so if you are in my class, you should expect a question like that. You should expect me to ask you to show that the probability of the sample space is one under some a potential probability measure. Or alternatively, very very similarly, I might ask you to, I might give you a probability measure, but it depends on some unknown constant. And I might ask you to compute what the constant is that causes this, the probability measure to be a valid probability measure. That is, the probability of the sample space would be one under that measure. All right, so, so this is something to look out for if you're actually taking classes from me. Uh, but let's uh, get back to the issue at hand. I need to show that the probability of the sample space under this probability model is in fact equal to one. So the probability of the sample space here is going to be the pro is going to end up being the sum. Um, I, I can basically view the sample space as consisting of you of as being the union of all of these uh, of events uh, con where each of these events contains uh, one of these uh, strings, h, t, t, h, t, 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 h, something like that. Uh, and this is actually a situation where that third form of uh, where the way I wrote down axiom three uh, before, you really actually needed it the way I wrote it down originally in like the body of the lecture notes rather than that uh, footnote. Because we actually do, in fact, here, have an infinite collection of events. So I'm going to write, this is going to be the sum over all the all of the omega that's in the sample space of the probability of that omega. All right. So remember what this is actually doing is summing up the probability of h, the probability of th, the probability of tth, the probability of tth, and so on. All right, uh, continuing on. Uh, we can then say that this is uh, equal to um, the sum over all omega in the sample space. Uh, we have our probability assignment. This is one half to the power of uh, n of omega. And at this point, I'm just going to say that n of omega is equal to the length that sample uh, is equal to the length that string. I can simplify what I'm writing down here a little bit by basically writing down uh, what the image of n is uh, under uh, 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 over the set s. So I can now write equivalently that this is going to be the sum when uh, n equals 1 to infinity of uh, 1 half to the power n. And now you should recognize from, I think they talk about this in Math 1010 at the University of Utah, uh, Intermediate Algebra, that this is a geometric sum. This is a geometric sum, and there is a formula for finding uh, the value of, of, of a geometric sum. So recall this formula from your previous classes. You have uh, a number r such that uh, the the uh, magnitude of r does not exceed 1. Then the sum from uh, n equals, uh, we'll say 1 to infinity of r to the power n is equal to 
r over 1 minus r. Remember that? Well, we're going to use that here right now. And we're going to say that this sum is equal to 1 half over 1 minus 1 half, which is equal to 1 half divided by 1 half, which is equal to 1. Which is what we wanted to show. We have now shown that the probability of the sample space under this probability measure is equal to 1. All right, hopefully you have written down this formula if you don't remember it. Because I need to reclaim that space. Now that we have this, we can now start answering some questions. Now that we know that this is a valid probability model, we can start using it. Uh, so under this model, what is the probability that the number of flips needed to see the first head uh, exceeds 4? So what I'm asking for is the probability of... Um, I, I'm going to have to write this in a somewhat funny looking way. Go away. Stop, stop bothering me. I'm going to have to write this in a somewhat funny looking way. I'm going to say that this is the probability of drawing an omega from the sample space uh, or, or drawing a sequence of flips such that um, the length of that sequence is greater than 4. And this is another one of those situations where it's actually easier to work with the complement and say that this is equal to 1 minus the probability of drawing a string of flips such that the length of that string is less than or equal to 4. Okay, this is actually a finite set because we can actually list out the strings of flips in which uh, uh, in, in which the length of that string is less than or equal to 4. We have heads, we have tails heads, we have tails tails heads, and tails 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 heads. So this is 1 minus the probability, uh, no, 1 minus uh, the probability that you get heads on the first flip plus the probability that you get tails heads, uh, first tails then heads, uh, plus the probability that you get tails and tails and heads, and then you have the probability of three tails and a head. And we can in fact figure out uh, what each of those probabilities are. The first probability is going to be one half. The second is going to be one half to the power of two or one fourth. The third is going to be one half to the power of three, or one eighth, uh, one eighth, and the last one is going to be one half to the power of four, or one sixteenth. And long story short, uh, this is going to be equal to one minus uh, fifteen over sixteen, which is equal to one over sixteen, which is kind of funny. It's a little funny to think about that. Why is it that it is equal to 1 over 16? Hmm. Well, here's kind of another way you could think about it. Um, well, it'll make more sense when you get to, when we start talking about uh, independence. But when thinking about independence, what you end up doing is, like, we know that if a coin is equally likely to get heads and tails then we know that uh, the probability of getting a heads is one half. So it's so what would then be the probability of getting four tails in a row? Um, because that we must get at least four tails in a row in order for us to have to have at least four flips in order for us to get a head. So what we're actually asking for is the probability of getting four tails in a row. So what I notice is, well, let's see. It's, if we were to think about um, getting two tails in a row, it seems like the probability of getting two tails in a row is one-fourth, and three tails in a row is one-eighth. Um, and then four tails of a row, well, that's one over sixteenth. Hmm. So that's an alternative way to think about what's going on here. Uh, but there's an algebraic way to get it, to, uh, an algebraic way to get the answer. All right, uh, the second part, what is the probability... The number, of, the number of flips until the experiment ends, in other words, the last flip will be heads, is between 3 and 20. Hmm. Uh, this one is a little bit more painful. Um, but actually, maybe we could use that trick. Hmm. Well, let's see. Uh, we What we could potentially do is say um, that the probability of observing a sequence of flips 
such that the length of that sequence um, is exactly less than three. Well, that's going to be, uh, so that's going to be the sequences where the length of the sequence is one or two. So that's going to be heads or tails heads, and that's going to be one half plus one fourth, which is uh, three fourths. Um, now let's compute the probability of uh, observing a sequence of flips where the length of that sequence is greater than 20. Now this is not so far computing the probability of uh, being between inclusively 3 and 20. But the reason why I'm computing these numbers is because I'm actually thinking I might want to use that complement trick again. So I want to compute this probability where the length of the sequence is um, at least, no, is strictly greater than 20. And I could actually use the arguments that I was using above to argue that this is going to be a sum from n equals uh, 21 to infinity of 1 half to the power n. All right. It's basically the same arguments that I was using before uh, to compute the size of the sample space because this is going to be uh, computing the, uh, so you have the sum of the probability when you have 21 flips and then probably when you have 22 flips and 23 flips and so on. And uh, I could say, hmm, what should I do next? The thing is, unfortunately, I don't have a formula for when we're adding up uh, starting at 21. I do have a formula when we add up starting at one. So maybe what we could do is try to find a sneaky way to uh, try adding up at one again. Uh, what I could potentially do is say that uh, n minus 20 plus 20, hmm, I could say uh, that this is equal to the sum uh, n minus 20 is equal to uh, 1, because that's equivalent to saying that n is equal to 21, right? Certainly. And then I could say this is 1 half uh, to the power uh, n minus 20 uh, plus 20. Hmm. hmm. Well, I know. I remember uh, now that uh, we can actually write this as uh, we can write this as a uh, or or the region the part enclosed in red as uh, one half to the power n minus twenty multiplied with one half to the power twenty. That's equivalent. Okay. Hmm. So what can I use with that? Well, I can now say that this is equal, oops, that uh, this is equal to uh, one half to the power, oh, I don't want red, uh, one half to the power 20, since that is effectively a constant that doesn't depend on n. And I have a sum from n minus 20 equals one up to infinity of one half to the power n minus 20. Uh, but what I could do is say, well, n minus 20, uh, you know what, I'm just gonna call that i. I'm just gonna call n minus 20, equal, uh, I'm just gonna say that's i. So replace all the n minus 20s with i. So i equals one to infinity, one half to the power i. Oh, I know how to compute this. I know how to compute this. This is going to be uh, one half times, uh, uh, one half divided by one minus one half. So actually this part right here, I actually, in fact, this is right here is pretty much a probability model. Uh, this is summing over the sample space. So this, this part, this blue part is equal to one. So that means that this probability is equal to, um, is uh, equal to one half to the power 20. Hmm, think about that. Uh, once again, going back to this probability, uh, the probability of getting a sample, uh, of getting a string of at least 20 means that you must have uh, flipped at least 20 tails. And I've computed effectively the probability of flipping, of getting 20 tails in a row. Huh. 
All right. Now, uh, I'm still not done, though. Uh, let's uh, start collecting this information. Um, I now know... Uh, let's see, that, uh, so I'm gonna start erasing all this because I need to start reclaiming some space. Uh, alright, so, uh, this is equal to, um, uh, one half to the power 20. Alright, so, uh, we can now say that the probability that uh, of uh, observing a sequence of flips such that three is less than or equal to the length of that sequence, which is less than or equal to 20, I could work instead with the complement of this and say this is one minus the probability of drawing an omega such that either n of omega is less than three or n of omega is greater than 20. And here's the thing, though. I've basically written down two disjoint sets. One set where n of omega is less than 3, or one set that is great, where n of omega is greater than 20. Um, so, I, so either a sequence ha is less than 3 flips or more than 20, fl 20 flips, but it's not both. So this is actually the union of two disjoint events. And therefore, I can say this is 1 minus the probability of uh, drawing an omega such that uh, n of omega is less than three uh, plus uh, the probability of drawing an omega such that uh, the length of the string omega is greater than 20. And I have computed both of those probabilities. So this is equal to uh, one minus three fourths uh, plus one half to the power uh, 20 and I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm not going to bother uh, trying to simplify this because this is the correct answer. So we're done at this point. I'm not going to go any further. Um, I'm going to, that said, reclaim all of this space and say, um, so hopefully you can uh, rewind if you missed some of that and uh, catch up on what you missed because I'm erasing this right now. Um, and uh, we're going to say, that uh, the probability of this event E is equal to one minus three fourths plus um, uh, one half to the power 20. All right, uh, next part, what is, oh yeah, I don't want this, this business. All right, uh, what is the probability that an even number of flips is seen before the experiment ends? Hmm. Uh, an even number of flips. How could I possibly think about that? Uh, so I want the probability of um, an even probability of an even number of uh, flips. And in short, using some of the reasoning that I was using above, I could say that this is the sum from of uh, one half, how, how would I represent an even number? I could say that an even number is two times a natural number. That guarantees that a number that a number is even. So just take any natural number you want and multiply it by two, and that's gonna be an even number. In fact, that's gonna cover all the even numbers. And I'm gonna sum this up from m equals one to infinity. Hmm, now what do I do next? Well, what I could do is recognize that I can basically take the m out and say that this is one half squared raised to the power of m, so that this is equal to the sum uh, when m equals one to infinity of one fourth to the power of m. Oh, I know how to sum that. That's going to be, since this is a geometric sum, one fourth over one minus one fourth, uh, which is equal to one fourth over three fourths and those one fourth parts cancel out so this ends up being one third so the probability of an even number of flips is one third which is kind of funny to think about if you think about it it seems like it like an even number of flips and an odd number of flips is equal to equally likely but actually no they're not equally likely at all it's much more likely to have an odd number of flips since it's much more likely to get one one flip exactly. Okay. 
Um, in fact, getting one flip is twice as likely as getting two flips. So by that reasoning, it actually makes perfect sense. Okay, uh, moving on to the next part. That was all a lot of work. That was a lot of work. Okay, uh, example 14. In a small town, 20% uh, of the population is considered wealthy, 30% of the population identifies as black, and 5% of the population is wealthy and black. Select a random individual from this population. Everyone equally likely to be selected, but I don't think that actually matters to this problem so much because of how I've laid it out. What is the probability that an individual is wealthy and not black? So let's see, let me catch up in my notes. Here's how I would like to think about this one. With problems like this where you have, uh, let's let's start out by saying that we've got uh, uh, we've got a we've we've got a sample space, but I'm not going to think too hard about what the sample space is for this one. I'm just going to say we have an event B, which uh, corresponds to an individual being black or uh, racially identifying as black. Uh, w will be the event that a person identifies as uh, no, not identifies. Uh, probably this is probably like some sort of a census business. So the Census Bureau has uh, maybe may have some uh, a more technical definition of wealthy, like they make over ninety thousand. Eh. Is making over ninety thousand rendering you wealthy? Well, it's, you're certainly well off, but um, anyway, the, that stuff aside, we'll just say W that denotes the event that you are wealthy by some uh, criterion, and uh, the probability of B that an individual is a is a black uh, will be 0.3. And the probability of W that this individual is wealthy is going to be 0.2. Okay, and that's just true because the problem said so. So now what we want to, well, actually, we're also given another thing, that the probability of an individual being both wealthy and black uh, is going to be uh, 0.05. Oh, by the way, here's the thing to keep in mind. Um, the probability of A and B is always going to be less than or equal to the probability of A. Or if you want, you can replace the probability of A with the probability of B. It's just as true. Uh, and that's because A and B is certainly a subset of A. And if you think about, um, if, if you think about what it, uh, about uh, probabilities in terms of areas, the area of a subset is certainly less than the less than or equal to the area of the thing it is it is uh, nested within. So you're always going to have a decrease in area. It's not possible, despite some human cognitive biases, uh, for uh, the probability of A and B or so, something being true and something else also being true. Uh, it is not possible for that to exceed the probability that the original thing is true. I think people sometimes confuse. Uh, intersection with conditional probability. Um, that's probably what is going on when pe when you start seeing those uh, studies talk about stuff like that. Anyway, uh, we need to figure out uh, what is the probability that this that an individual selected from this uh, from this uh, village is wealthy and not black. And here's how I like to solve problems like this. Uh, let's make it clear. All right. Here's how I like to solve problems like, like this. I like to create a Venn diagram. And in that Venn diagram, I will start filling out regions. So we'll have the wealthy circle and the black circle. And we'll have this, and we have the sample space. Uh, and uh, you start thinking about this like a puzzle. Like we know that the wealthy and black part is 0.05. Oh, we're gonna need to zoom in some more. So the wealthy and black part, that is going to be 0.05, okay? And then we have the wealthy part, which is 0.2, but we can't point, put 0.2 here because that 0.2 is also including that 0.05. So we need to put here is 0.15 so that when we add uh, the, this uh, blue region and this red region, those need to add up to 0.2, okay? Uh, now for the black part. Um, that needs to add up to 0.3, so that means that the part in, that is not in the intersection needs to be 0.25. Uh, I didn't write that very clearly. Um, that needs to be point, uh, 0.25, okay? 
which for what it's worth, we now know the probability of W or B, which would be 0.45, which means that the probability of being neither wealthy nor black is going to be 0.55. So that's something that I recommend when you encounter problems like these. Create a Venn diagram and then fill out the diagram. Figure out the probability of every single little sliver in that Venn diagram, and then you can get any probability you want. All right. Um, and it will, it will be like a genuine, a, a generally useful chart for you, not just for that individual problem, because often these uh, problems come in bunches. All right. So uh, continuing on, the probability of being wealthy and not black. Well, actually, that corresponds... Uh, in our uh, little chart up here to the blue region, which is going to be 0.15. So this is going to be uh, 0.15. Okay, what is the probability that the individual is neither wealthy nor black? Actually, I already computed that. I said it in words, it's going to be 0.55. All right, uh, next example. A ball contains a bag contains balls and blocks. Thirty percent of the bag's contents are balls. An object is either red or blue, and forty percent of the objects are red. An object is made of either wood or plastic, and sixty-five percent of the objects are wooden. Ten percent of the objects are wooden balls. Five percent of the objects are red balls, and twenty percent of the objects are red and plastic. Two percent of the, the objects are red plastic. Uh, uh, there's a typo here. Uh, we're going to need to change blocks to balls okay reach into the bag and pick out an object at random each object equally likely to be selected what is the probability that the object selected is a ball red or wooden and this is inclusive by the way well this is another one of those problems where what i suggest you do is you create a venn diagram to represent the situation and fill out all of the little parts of that Venn diagram. So what does that look like here? Um, all right, so I've got my Venn diagram. This is my sample space. All uh, right, so I've got giant circles, but I should probably be a bit more precise about, uh, let, let's start, before I start filling out this chart, uh, let's create some notation and fill out what we already know in mathematical notation. So we've got balls. So B will be uh, the event that we grab a ball. And we'll say, so objects are either red or blue. So we'll say R is the event that an object pulled out of here is red. So B complement is going to be a block and R complement is going to be a blue object. And we say, that uh, so we can either have wood or plastic so we'll have a w correspond uh to the event that you get a wooden object all right uh, let's start collecting some more information uh, we have that the probability of uh drawing a stop it uh, we have the probability of drawing a ball so the probability of the event b is equal to 0.3 uh, the probability of getting a red object is uh, 0.4. Uh, the probability of a wooden object, probability of a wooden object is going to be 0.65. Uh, the uh, probability that an object is a wooden ball, well, that's W intersected with B since the object is both wooden and a ball, that is going to be 0.1. Uh, the probability of getting a red, ball, uh, a, a red ball is going to be 0.05. Uh, the probability of getting uh, um, something that's red and plastic, so that's R and W complement, uh, that's going to be 0.2. And finally, uh, we have uh, the probability of drawing a red uh, plastic, so W complement, uh, block, 
No, no, not a block. It's not a block. It's a ball. This is equal to 0.02. Okay. So, 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 so. Uh, we need to start filling out this chart. We're going to have... Uh, we're going to have red here, we're going to have balls here, and we're going to have uh, wooden objects over here. Uh, I always recommend starting out with the smallest region first. So the greatest intersection. Uh, start out with that and then fill outwards. So in this case, the smallest region is red plastic balls. Uh, where is that on our Venn diagram? Uh, you are in R, you're in B, but you're not in W, so that actually corresponds to the blue region. Okay, so the probability of the blue region according to the problem is 0.02. All right, uh, next up, we could probably ask for uh, what is the probability of being red and plastic? Uh, red and plastic, uh, that corresponds to being um, Let's see, so you're in the red region, uh, but you're not in the W region. So that's going to correspond to this blue area. And we know that the probability of being red and plastic is 0.2, but we've already got a 0.02. So that means that, that uh, in the other part, we're going to be left with 0.18. So the probability of being a red plastic block is going to be 0.18. All right, uh, how about next? Uh, we've got uh, the probability of being a red ball. So a prob the probability of being uh, a red ball is going to be 0.05. What corresponds to red balls? Well, this is the ball. So we have the balls region and we have red stuff. So that's going to be corresponding to the red region. Okay, and that is 0.05, which means we've already got a 0.02 here. It needs to add a 0.05, so that means that this little slipper in the middle is going to be 0.03. Okay, uh, let's see. We need next uh, wooden balls. So wooden balls corresponds to this green region. Uh, the probability of being a wooden ball is 0.1. So that we've already got a 0 0.03, so that means that uh, we've got 0 0.07 in this other little sliver. All right, we're getting close to done. Uh, what about, uh, let's see. So we've got uh, wooden balls, red balls, red plastic things. Uh, what else have we got? Well, we can, we, we've got the probability of balls. The probability of balls is going to be point. Uh, point 0.3 and uh, that so balls correspond to this blue region and we've already got um, point 0.12 of the area accounted for the total area needs to be three uh, point 0.3 so that means that for this uh, remaining sliver uh, we have point 0.18 for its area okay uh, next up next up well, we've got um, the probability of red stuff, and we know that the probability of red stuff is 0.4. So 0.2. So red stuff is going to be uh, the region I've just encircled in red, and so far 0.23 of that area is accounted for, uh, but point its total area is going to be 0.4. So that means that uh, only. Uh, so that means that when we're filling out uh, this remaining blue sliver. It must be 0.17. Okay, and for wooden stuff, we know that the total area in the wooden region is going to be 0.65, and uh, 0.27 of that area is already accounted for, so that means that the remaining uh, area is going to be 0.38. All right, and we are almost done. We actually, in fact, know the probability of everything else. If you were to add up all of those probabilities, they would add up to 0.98, so that means that the remaining area that is outside of this region is 0.02. All right, we have filled out that diagram, and we are ready to answer some questions. What is the probability that an object selected is a ball, red, or wooden? So that's the probability of R or W or B, and we have already figured that out. 
that corresponds uh, to the 0 0.02. So that is equal to uh, 0 0.02. Okay, uh, next up. What is the probability that the object is a red wooden ball? Uh, so the probability of being red, of being red and wooden and a ball. What is that going to be? Well, we're going to go back to our diagram that we created. Uh, we look for uh, red wooden balls. So you need to be in the red circle. You need to be uh, wooden. So you need to be in the blue circle. And you need to be a ball. So you need to be in the green circle. Uh, oh, I guess that's a darker blue. So that leaves us 0.03. So that leaves us 0 0.03 for that for uh, that area. So this is going to be 0 0.03. All right. Uh, what is the probability? Let's go ahead and do some zooming out. We no longer need such fine control in drawing. Uh, what is the probability that an object is a blue plastic block? Well, the probability of being a blue, which is the complement of red, uh, not in a color sense, not li like when artists talk about compliments, that's uh, red is not a compliment of blue, but whatever in a probabilistic sense in, in our probability model. Uh, so that's the region that we've drawn here. And it's actually a problem. I'm going to leave this to yourself, but look up De Morgan's laws, uh, learn about De Morgan's laws, uh, for my students, this is an assignment. Um, I believe if I remember right, but basically this is r union w union b complement which then means it's one minus the probability of r union w union b and that is a probability you've already figured out that's one minus 0 0.98 which is equal to 0 0.02 okay Okay, so that's it for the examples. Those were a lot of examples. But I'm just gonna, we're, we're now wrapping up this section and I'm going to wrap up this section with a short discussion on it, the interpretation of probability. Now it turns out this is actually a rather large topic. Um, philosophers actually are debating uh, what do probabilities actually mean? Uh, uh, and what is an appropriate uh, definition of, uh, of, a, of what a probability is? Because we have a mathematical notion of probability, but that doesn't necessarily translate into a real-world notion of probability. Now, I'm going to leave that discussion aside. I might make an aside video um, about uh, the interpretation of probability. But in this class, despite the limitations of this interpretation, we're going to adopt the frequentist interpretation of probability which is interpreting probabilities as long run frequencies of events. So in other words, if we were to repeat an event, an experiment many, 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 many times, and each of those rep repetitions were independent of the past, uh, we would, the, the, the sample proportion of times, uh, we would see that experiment occur would approach that probability. So here's kind of an idea, uh, here's a chart that kind of illustrates this idea. Um, we're going to have um, along the, the y-axis, uh, the y-axis ranges from 0 to 1, and somewhere along here we have the probability of some event uh, E. Ugh. Stop being uncooperative, tablet. Alright, so we have the probability of an event E. Okay. And uh, along the x-axis, well, it's not really the x-axis this time. It will be the n-axis. And we're going to mark this axis off at integer values. 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, and so on. And um, uh, we are going to track uh, p hat n, which is the sample proportion of times the event E occurs. 
and you remember how to compute sample proportions. Uh, but here's kind of the thing about what we're doing here. Uh, we are remembering pat the past. So you could imagine that we uh, are flipping a coin and we're tracking how many times we see heads in this uh, experiment. And uh, uh, so the first time you flip it, you're going to have either one or zero heads. And uh, the second time, you're going to keep the result of that first flip, but then recompute your proportion for a sample size of two. Uh, for the third time, you then flip the coin a third time and you keep the previous two results uh, and then recompute the proportion using those previous two results and also the third flip you just did uh, and so on. Keep doing this in a sequence. So uh, what could possibly happen? So I'm going to put a little dashed line at the probability of E. According to the frequentist interpretation of probability, uh, the probability is basically this long run frequency where if you're tracking p hat n, you'll start out at um, like maybe zero or one, depending on whether the event happened on the first trial or not. And then you might track that it happens on the second trial and the third trial and the fourth trial and so on. And what will happen is this line will get very, very close to the probability of E. Um, and that's how frequentists think about probabilities as a long run proportion, as a limiting proportion. Um, now, the, there is an unfortunate thing about this uh, interpretation, which is that actually in mathematical probability theory, that is not an assumption, that's a theorem. So this is not something that we assume is true. This is something we prove is true. So why are we assuming that something is true that we then prove is true? That, that seems like a circular reasoning, and it's unfortunate. Uh, but I'm going to leave those philosophical issues aside. Uh, because at some level, my own personal belief is that all of those technical philosophical issues aside, at some level, it's almost an, a limitation of human language. Uh, and probability theory, despite our difficulty in coming up with a definition, a proper definition for it, uh, is a very real phenomenon. So whatever the definition is, it matches this frequentist notion. Uh, I've actually got some R code here that you can look at. Uh, this function, uh, R is able of ge uh, capable of generating random numbers and set seed is what's known as, sets what's known as a random seed and make sure that when you're generating random numbers, they actually are going to come up with the exact same results uh, at the same time. So if you run this code, it will produce the exact same results, uh, at least in principle. Uh, different versions of software may cause different results, but uh, whatever. Um, so I set the sample size for my experiments. Uh, I uh, conduct a number of flips. Uh, I track, uh, I, I cumulatively track the number of heads in these flips. And then I plot these uh, sample proportions and also draw a line at the theoretical probability of that event. So this is the case when you were to, if you were to flip a coin, uh, flip 15 times and keep a running proportion of how many times you saw heads. This is what it looks like. Um, and you can kind of see it seems to be converging around 0.5. Uh, if we repeat this experiment, but this time when n is equal to 50, what we'll see is it kind of looks like it's getting even closer to something constant. And then if we were to repeat this again, but now uh, the sample size is 500, uh, it almost converges. It almost converges to the truth. Now, that said, with probabilities, it never means that you are guaranteed to see that many in any single sample. We did not say that, uh, which means that at the very end here, you're not actually at one half. You're pretty close to one half, but you're not at one half. But if you were to just keep going on like this and you were in fact possible for you to continue forever and God suddenly grants you the ability to live forever so long as you continue to flip this coin, at the end of eternity, you will have one half of flip. Uh, half of your flips will be one half. That's basically what we're saying. All right, so that's it for this video. Quite intense, quite intense. It's probably giving you some idea that probability can get rather out of hand, um, at least in terms of uh, computational complexity. Uh, but uh, I've given you a number of useful examples and a number of useful techniques. The thing though is those techniques like they're useful now and it's good for you to see them, but you always kind of have to adapt to individual problems. The next section is going back to the situation where uh, you have a finite sample space 
we're going to talk about how you count elements from that sample space. This part is both fun and frustrating because it's fun because we get to talk about things like poker problems and gambling and, and, and stuff like that. But it's frustrating because counting is hard. Counting is really hard. And also, like, I would love it to tell, give you a magic formula that solves every and all counting problems. And I will give you some formulas, but those are kind of, those are just tools that you kind of need to combine. And the com combination of those tools, that's the hard part. And I can't really give you a general principle for that. Every counting problem is kind of its own thing. But enough of that. We're, we're calling it for now. Uh, I will see you later in the future video on counting.